Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. And there were some things I always thought were just legends when I was a kid. Some things seemed just too frightening and bizarre to be part of the McDonald's, CNN, Disney Channel public school reality that I was beginning to get to know. I thought monsters weren't real. I thought magic wasn't real. That's what I was told. The world is straightforward. Humans understand how it all works. All the big mysteries have been solved. The universe is just a collection of lifeless gears and uncaring mechanisms. There is nothing behind this. I was taught my mind and consciousness were merely evolutionary aberrations and they would vanish into nothing when I died. The culture has been telling me my whole life that they have it figured out. Trust them. My teachers have been telling me the truth. Why would they hide anything? Why would they lie to me? Why would they lie to themselves? Ah, uh, childhood. And then I took a look around the world, studied science for almost 20 years, learned the broad strokes of history, and learned to trust almost nothing written in stone, and to always be critical of authorities and dogma. The only thing some people like to control more than others is the narrative. Stories and fiction are how the biggest and most interesting truths escape concealment. I remember the witches from Wizard of Oz, a good witch and a bad witch. Turns out there is a, there is a historical lesson in that movie. Witches, warlocks, and diableros, which is a word that can mean either demon hunter or evil sorcerer capable of transforming into other animals. These people are not playing around. They mean business, and the things they've been known to do are extremely dangerous and involve real devil shit. This is the stuff of horror movies, which of course I love. I came across a book several years ago by Christian Ratch called The Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants. And it describes one of the main rituals used in witchcraft, where the practitioners use a deadly poison to explore other worlds, to gain knowledge, and also to help and destroy others. And the witches use something called flying ointment. Now that makes it sound like it's a skin cream for frequent air travelers, but far from it. A flying ointment is a dangerous, potentially lethal drug cocktail. It was and is still used today by religious groups to commune with spirits, gain supernatural insight, and also to murder and destroy others. The ointment is at the core of a sacrament known as the witch's Sabbath. And the hallucinogenic flying ointment is applied to the witch's genitals, uh, using, according to legend, the magic broomstick. Now, I don't remember Alyssa Milano or Shannon Doherty ever discussing this in the show Charmed, but witches' use of flying ointments was first described in the 1400s by Johann Hartlieb in 1456. It was also described in more depth by the Spanish theologian Alfonso Tostado in 1455 in his book The Supergenesis Commentaria, and it was reprinted in 1507. And in this book, he describes the wide-scale celebration of the witch's Sabbath. And going back before this, there was a written record from 1477, and it describes the confession of a woman named Antone Rose, who admitted that the devil gave her a stick 18 inches in length, on which she would rub an ointment, and with the words, go, in the name of the devil, go, would fly to a synagogue which actually at the time was an alternative name for the Sabbath used in witchcraft. Flying ointments are as real as anything else, with plenty of historical and scientific evidence. And there are a lot of detailed recipes on the record, and this is where things get really interesting. More than a few of these recipes contain a certain ring of truth to chemists. And hundreds of years ago, the witches seemed to know more about chemistry and pharmacology than they had any business knowing. How did they learn this? Now, for some of the recipes and the science behind it. Because even if you don't believe in the spirit world, believe in the power of pharmacology. So the ingredients you find doing research span the spectrum from fantastical and ridiculous like Eye of Newt or the eyelash of a blue whale to something somewhat realistic. Stuff, plants containing chemicals that are known to affect the human body. And where things get even more interesting is when these recipes, or grimoires as they're called, mention specific combinations of plants that contain drugs that are known to reinforce the effects of one another. So putting these plants together can have synergistic, surprising, and very powerful results. So in general, drug combos can add up to more than the sum of their parts. Look at ayahuasca, 
That's a perfect example. This is a potion used and is still was used and is still used in the Amazon to commune with nature, ancestors, and spirits. And now, in order for it to work, two separate plants are required, each containing a necessary part of the mix. And they don't work without, without each other. So one of them is a serotonergic hallucinogen, a dimethyltryptamine, and that's found in a few different plants in the area. And the other plant contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And this plant, Bonasteriopsis copy, also known as the vine of the souls. Now, how did Amazonians figure this out thousands of years ago before any understanding of chemistry? So there's another, there's a component of flying ointment when you do this research that really stands out. Many of them call for the fat of a dead infant or child. Uh, this is gross and scary, but it's also kind of plausible because maybe there is something to the lipid profile in the fat that helps aid in skin absorption and delivery of the drugs in the ointment. And there's a, throughout the literature on this, there's a few different types of fat that are used in the preparation of. So human fat is made up of triglycerides. And you could think of a triglyceride as a glycerol molecule, which is, has three arms and is bound to three separate fatty acid molecules. So glycerol is an alcohol in the chemical sense of the word, meaning that it has hydroxyl and OH group at the end. And fatty acids are carboxylic acids, carboxylic acids. And then they have a carboxyl group, which is that COOH group at the end. And these alcohols and acids join in a process called esterification. So each glycerol molecule can have three fatty acids bound to it. And this is where you get a triglyceride. So that's a large component in the fat of a human being and other animals as well. So it, this could potentially help a drug get through, the, get through the skin, get through the epidermis and into the system. So there are, when you look into the science of drug delivery, there are nonpolar compounds, oils, fats that are used to help deliver drugs. So the other ingredient that you find in a lot of these come from the deadly, a lot of this, these ingredients come from the deadly nightshade family of plants, the Solanaceae. And this is a family of flowering plants that ranges from annual to perennial herbs, vines, lianas, epiphytes, shrubs, and trees. And they include a number of agricultural crops as well, uh, medicinal plants, spices, weeds, and uh, household, household ornamentals. But many members of this family contain very po potent alkaloids, and some of these are very toxic. But in, remember in a previous episode, I remember, the, remember this family of plants also contains tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, uh, and also peppers as well. So they can have, um, you know, very minimal amounts of these toxins. A lot of the plants that are used in the preparation of flying ointments rely on plants from the Datura genus. So these include um, jimson weed, it's called moonflower, thorn apples, devil's trumpets. There's a million different names from these things. And they're all in the Datura family and belladonna as well. And this is probably the most toxic of the group. And you'll find belladonna listed as, uh, as an ingredient in a lot of the, the flying potions. So all parts of the plant contain what are known as tropane alkaloids. So the roots have a little bit over a percent, the leaves as well. The stalks have a little less, the flowers even less than that. And these plants can really vary a lot in their alkaloid content. So even being planted in similar areas, they, from plant to plant, the levels of the alkaloids and the, the poison, the drugs, can vary like five to ten times. And the plants may even sort of look identical. The leaves in the plants reach the maximum drug content when the plant is budding and flowering. And the roots, the most poisonous part, uh, are at their worst at the end of the plant's vegetation period. So if you look at the chemicals in here, they can largely composed of three different things. So you have atropine, scopalamine, and hyoscyamine. So atropine may be familiar to the audience. So this is a pretty toxic compound, but it's also an antidote to some, uh, some very deadly uh, chemical weapons out there. So I'll go into the reasons behind that a little later. So I talked about the LD50 in a previous episode. So the LD50 of atropine and the others as well as kind of close to this is about 75 milligrams per kilogram. And these drugs are classified as anticholinergics. The anticholinergics present in the deadly nightshade family affect the muscarinic receptor. So these muscarinic receptor antagonists, as they're called, these drugs, they're agents that block the activity of the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. Now the muscarinic receptor is a protein that's involved in the transmission of signals through certain parts of the nervous system. This, these receptor antagonists work by 
Reducing the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for stimulation of the rest and digest or the, uh, the feed and breed activities that occur when the body is at rest, especially after eating. And these include sexual arousal, salivation, lacrimation or crying tears, urination, digestion, and defecation. Its action is described as being complementary to that of the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for activities associated with the fight or flight response. So drugs with, the mus with this muscarinic antagonism are used widely in medicine, and they can treat low heart rate, overactive bladder, respiratory problems such as asthma and COPD, and also they're being looked at for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease as well. But these receptor antagonist drugs, when they're used in medicine, can have some unwanted side effects, such as difficulty urinating, dry mouth and skin, and also constipation. So the, uh, the chemical acetylcholine is extremely important, and I went into some depth in my, uh, my smoking stool syndrome episode. So it's a neurotransmitter whose receptors are the proteins that are found in the synapses of the nerve cells and other cell membranes as well. Acetylcholine receptors can be classified into really two groups. So you have the muscarinic receptor and the nicotinic receptor, which I mentioned it in the last episode, just responds to nicotine. They just seem to made for nicotine. So you see scopalamine is actually prescribed quite a bit for motion sickness and also for post-operative nausea and vomiting. And uh, you usually see this, uh, sometimes a sea sickness patch will use scopalamine. And this is very similar to, uh, to atropine. Another name for scopalamine is hyoscine. So they're, that, they're just the same thing, but some people make a distinction between them. So bat's blood, blood of a poor little bat. So, you know, it's funny, I looked into this and it seemed like one of those sort of far-fetched eye of newt type ingredients, but it turns out that people do take uh, bat's blood medicinally, especially in, in Asia. And it, I'm not sure even what they're trying to treat, but they kill a lot of bats to take their blood. Kind of like, uh, you know, people used to think rhino horns would give them boners. I suspect there's maybe, well, or there could be something going on inside bat's blood. So at right now, science doesn't really know what could be going on there and why that was uh, listed as an important ingredient in a lot of flying ointments. But we may find out down the road that there is something in there, something that's active in the human body and something that does potentiate the effects of the other drugs in the uh, flying ointment. So it's possible that we're just catching up to the witches. So another thing you find in there, um, you find in a lot of these potions, is uh, opium. So Papaver somniferum. So this is uh, the same plant that gives you poppy seeds that you put on your bagels. And it's an ornamental plant that you can grow in gardens that are sort of around everywhere. But, you know, it is true, poppy seeds. Uh, they, if you look at the white stuff on the outside of them, that, is, uh, that latex actually contains morphine. So that is, and it's which is proven on Mythbusters, that you can test positive for, uh, for opiates if you consume enough poppy seeds. So this is, this is interesting because the witches were using this in there with the deadly nightshade plants. And th there is a synergy that science knows about between these plants and the poppy alkaloids. And this, is, this was made use of in the so-called twilight sleep. So this was, like an, this was an early form of uh, anesthesia to help with childbirth. And twilight sleep, it was a, a drug mixture of scopalamine, which you find a lot of in belladonna, and morphine. And it was injected and yielded a combination of painkilling and also amnesia for women in labor, which you could imagine that would be sort of useful. So there's actually a version of this drug I found out that's still being manufactured. I'm not sure where it's being used, but it's called Omnipon, O-M-N-O-P-O-N. -O -O so there's some other, one other ingredient that you find in a lot of grimoire recipes for flying ointments is something called aconitine. And this is a lesser known alkaloid from the uh, aconitum plant. And this, is, this plant is also known as monk's hood or devil's helmet. Now this plant is nasty. And it, it's notorious for its toxic properties. Aconitine is chemical weapon level toxic. So I mentioned with atropine, it was 75 milligrams per kilogram that would kill half the rats or mice. Well, this is one milligram per kilogram. So this, like tetrodotoxin, interacts with the voltage dependent sodium ion channels. So essentially this, this drug turns off the voltage in the nerve cells and just shuts everything down. It's used a lot in China 
it's used in small doses, but you can imagine um, it's not used very widely because it's, uh, it has a narrow therapeutic index, which means that in order to get the drug to do anything, you have to give somebody almost what it takes to kill them. And that is consistent with a, with a compound that has a LD50 of one milligram per kilogram. It's just really scary to think about something like that. And some of the really worst toxins on Earth are even worse than that. See a uh, smoking stool syndrome episode. I'm going to read a passage from Carlos Castaneda's famous book. His first book, The Teachings of Don Juan, A Yaqui Way of Knowledge, which is him recounting his interaction with a, a famous Yaqui shaman. And this is a, it's a terrific book. I really recommend. I've read it. I've read, it's one of the few books I've actually read several times. And I just, I love Don Juan as a character. And what he says is just fascinating. So I'm going to read you a little bit of this. So the, uh, this is Carlos Castaneda's account of uh, his interaction with Don Juan. And he's describing events that took place in 1963. So in what I'm going to read, uh, Carlos Castaneda and Shaman Don Juan are discussing detura and preparation of what could be called nothing other than a flying ointment, even though they don't mention that term specifically. One of the key ingredients in that ointment was lard, and specifically the lard of a wild boar. Okay, so this is from Castaneda's account. Don Juan tells him, My benefactor told me it was permissible to mix the plant with lard, and that is what you are going to do. My benefactor, my benefactor mixed it with lard for me, but as I've already said, I was never very fond of the plant and never really tried to become one with her. My benefactor told me that for best results, those who really want to master the power, the proper thing is to mix the plant with the lard of a wild boar. The fat of the intestines is the best. But it is for you to choose. Perhaps the turn of the wheel will decide that you take the devil's weed as an ally, in which case I will advise you, as my benefactor advised me, to hunt a wild boar and get the fat from the intestines. In other times, when the devil's weed was tops, brujos used to go on special hunting trips to get the fat from wild boars. They sought the biggest and strongest males. They had a special magic for wild boars. They took from them a special power, so special that it was hard to believe, even in those days. But that power is lost. I don't know anything about it, and I don't know of any man who knows about it. Perhaps the weed herself will teach you all that. Don Juan measured a handful of lard, dumped it into the bowl containing the dry gruel, and scraped the lard left on his hand onto the edge of the pot. He told me to stir the contents until they were smooth and thoroughly mixed. I whipped the mixture for nearly three hours. Don Juan looked at it from time to time and thought it was not yet done. Finally, he seemed satisfied. The air... Whipped into the paste had given it a light gray color and the consistency of jelly. He hung the bowl from the roof next to the other bowl. He said he was going to leave it there until the next day because it would take two days to prepare the second portion. He told me not to eat anything in the meantime. I could have water, but no food at all. Now the next day, Don Juan gives Carlos directions on the use of the ointment. He took the bone stick and cut two horizontal lines on the surface of the paste, thus dividing the contents of the bowl into three equal parts. Then, starting at the center of the top line, he cut a vertical line perpendicular to the other two, dividing the paste into five parts. He pointed to the bottom right area and said that was for my left foot. The area above it was for my left leg. The top and largest part was for my genitals. The next one below, on the left side, was for my right leg, and at the area at the bottom left was for my right foot. He told me to apply the part of the paste designated for my left foot to the sole of my foot and rub it thoroughly. Then he guided me into applying the paste on the inside part of my left leg, on my genitals, down the inside of my whole right leg, and finally on the sole of my right foot. And then the transformation begins. And this is what Carlos Castaneda recounts from the experience of being on the drug. My legs were rubbery and long, extremely long. I took another step. My knee joints felt springy, like a vault pole. They shook and vibrated and contracted elastically. I moved forward. The motion of my body was slow and shaky. It was more like a tremor forward and up. 
I slowed down and saw Don Juan sitting below me, way below me. The momentum carried me forward one more step, which was even more elastic and longer than the preceding one. And from there I soared. I remember coming down once. Then I pushed up with both feet, sprang backward, and glided on my back. I saw the dark sky above me and the clouds going by me. I jerked my body so I could look down. I saw the dark mass of mountains. My speed was extraordinary. My arms were fixed, folded against my sides. My head was the directional unit. If I kept it bent backward, I made vertical circles. I changed directions by turning my head to the side. I enjoyed such freedom and swiftness as I'd never known before. The marvelous darkness gave me a feeling of sadness, of longing, perhaps. It was as if I had found a place where I belonged. The darkness of night. I tried to look around, but all I sensed was the night. It was serene, and yet it held so much power. Suddenly, I knew it was time to come down. It was as if I had been given direct order. I had to obey. And I began descending like a feather with lateral motions. That type of movement made me very ill. It was slow and jerky, as though I were being lowered by pulleys. I got sick. My head was bursting with the most excruciating pain. A kind of blackness enveloped me. I was aware of the feeling of being suspended in it. The next thing I remember is the feeling of waking up. I was in my bed, in my room. I sat up. And then the image of my room dissolved. I stood up. I was naked. The motion of standing made me sick again. I recognized some of the landmarks. I was about a half a mile from Don Juan's house near the place of his detura plants. Suddenly, everything fitted into place, and I realized that I would have to walk all the way back to his house, naked. So there's a book called The Varieties of the Psychedelic Experience by Ariel Masters and Gene Houston, and they go in a little bit about the flying ointments, describing that the witch's ointment already was known in the 15th century, and that it was thought to produce dreams or illusions of flying, and attendance at the Sabbat. This is clear from a case cited at the time. A Dominican priest had watched a woman rub herself with the ointment and fall into a trance. When she awakened, she claimed to have been transported to the Sabbat and to have joined the revels there. The witch's ointment was actually analyzed in the 16th century by Andreas de Laguna, physician to Pope Julius III. Of a tube taken from a witch, Laguna reported that the ointment was green in color and contained hemlock, Salinum, Mandragora, and Henbane. So, Seducius Triumphatus is a book on witchcraft by Joseph Glanville. He published this in 1681. He was an English writer who traveled to Sweden and observed a lot of occult rituals going on there in Sweden. And in his book, he describes something called the blockula. Also in, in Swedish, it's blackula. And if you look that up, it says no relation to the movie. It actually says that. So the Blockula was a legendary island where the devil apparently held his earthly court during the witch's Sabbath. This island could only be reached by a magical flight using these uh, witch's ointments. It was described as a delicate large meadow where you can see no end. There was said to be a large gate located in the meadow that led to a smaller meadow. In the smaller meadow, there stood a house. In an enormous room in this house, there stood a very long table at which the witches sat down. And by this room was another chamber where there were very lovely and delicate beds. The devil was dressed in a gray coat and red and blue stockings. He had a red beard and a high crowned hat with linen of diverse colors and long garters upon his stockings. The devil then would go with them, the women that he liked best, into the chamber where he committed venerous acts with them. And this indeed they all confessed, that he had carnal knowledge of them, and that the devil had sons and daughters by them, which he did marry together, and they did couple, and brought forth toads and serpents. Wow, who would have thought these stories would be so erotic? So there's, I'm going to read a description of an, uh, kind of an elaborate ointment, and this is from the Errores Gazerarium. Take a red-haired man known to be a good Catholic, Take off his clothes, tie him down on a bench so that he is unable to move, and then let venomous animals loose on him. 
when he has expired from their bites and stings, hang the body upside down and place a bowl under his head and mouth. Let the distillations falling from his body be caught in the bowl. Mix these with the fat of a hanged man, the entrails of children, and the bodies of the poisonous creatures that had been used to affect the victim's demise. The uses of the salves and powders, so procured are many. By smearing them on sticks or brooms, one renders those objects capable of bearing one aloft, or else one anoints one's own body to the same end. So people are still using these concoctions, these potions. And I found a, a few different um, recounts of experiences online. Now, if you really want to find out about um, you know, illegal drugs or the way that uh, chemicals affect the body, a really good place, a really good resource is arrowid.org. And they have um, a listing of experiences of drugs, dosages that um, are really well broken down. And they have experts there that cultivate everything and do a really great job and make a really informative website. So this is a modern experience. And this is taken from arrowid.org. And this one's called Hellish Leaf. I didn't write this. So this is uh, from S the fellow's name is, uh, or the person's name is Samwise. The seeds were little clear and somewhat bitter. We decided we didn't want to waste any of the plant. So we brewed a tea with the shells and drank it. Then we peeled off the inside skins of the pods and ate that. And finally, we smoked the outer shell. During the first 20 minutes, nothing too noticeable happened. Colors seemed more vibrant, and my throat was getting kind of dry. When I went to the bathroom to pee, very little actually came out. We decided that we should go to a different, nearby park. As we were walking to the park, basically I felt the effects of being poisoned. I had jello legs, and my eyes couldn't focus on anything specific for too long. When we got to the park, we walked over and basically slumped down at a picnic table. At this point, my throat was painfully dry. We had a jug of water, which I kept drinking voraciously. I also really had to pee. I walked in a secluded, I walked in a secluded area behind some bushes and tried. Nothing. So frustrating. I jello walked back to the table and our friend G was randomly there. He was driving past and saw us. As he was talking to us, he could tell we were different and lackadaisical. Oh, I know what you guys took, he said, and started laughing. I could barely look at him. He told us to call him later and tell him how our experience was. Then some girl came and sat down at the table and started talking to us. There's a school nearby, so there's lots of people in and out of the park. I don't remember what she said to us. We pulled up to Drew's house around 9 o'clock with no memory of what had happened in between. We walked inside, and sure enough, there's a party going on. We see about 20 or so of our friends drinking, laughing, and being loud. There were also strangers. Drew excused himself and went to his room. I was still talking with some friends, and I noticed my friend Preston, who was there, crying blood. It looked like eye shadow, a blood circle around his eyes. It was horrifically bizarre, and he just looked like he was in pain. Are you okay? I asked, and he just stared at me with an almost evil gaze, blood dripping from his face to the floor. I saw a grotesque people I didn't recognize, one who looked like sloth from the Goonies, but not in a comical way at all. They looked deformed, bruised, beaten, and burned as all these people shuffled around the house. Some were laughing maniacally, some crying, others just staring. It was unsettling, to say the least. Things were also painted on. It's like a dream, and the 3D world is irrelevant. There were burnt cigarettes and tacks sticking sharp side up on the ground, and bizarre-looking plants pasted to the walls and doors. I then saw people with beet red skin crying blood. They look like what you would expect demons to look like, just like every other fairy tale or myth or religious text makes them out to be, minus perhaps the wings. None of this seemed particularly odd to me at the time. I was confused who they were, but I wasn't gripped with fear like I probably would have been when I was sober. Some of these entities were having passionate, crazy sex in the back room, but they didn't look as if they were actually enjoying themselves. I kept hearing the sounds of doors slamming. My friend Drew came back to see what I was up to. You guys are late. We were here waiting for you, he said. There was a pale creature with no eyelids with the most piercing stare I've ever seen in my entire life. 
sitting in the front passenger seat of my car. His head was shaped almost like a shark's, pointing at the top, and he had no lips and a sh sharp, shark-like teeth. In fact, he looked exactly like he the Hellraiser character Butterball, minus the sunglasses, and paler. And just like in the movie, he said nothing. I had seen Hellraiser once before, when I was like 12, I remembered near nothing from it. It wasn't until I actually saw the movie again that I made the connection. In fact, I'm fairly confident Clive Barker has taken Detura before, after going through this experience. And the fact he wore sunglasses in the movie, and in reality had no eyelids at all, seemed more like a coincidence to me. This powerful entity was the only one I could not look straight in the face. I tried avoiding his gaze the entire time. I looked at a tree in the front yard. I could see a ghostly essence in the tree itself. Actually, I could see the essence of all plant life. Thank you very much. This is Vanadium, and I'm Chris Rankin. <laughs>